Okay, I'm going to try to see here. Um, okay. Um, all right, here we are. So as you see on the screen, uh, the title that was actually given to me uh, by uh, Father Provincial Ross uh, several months ago is called Faithful and Creative Discipleship in a Wounded World. Missiological reflection uh, in the last several years on how individuals and church communities might engage in mission today has focused on the fact that our world today is suffering from many serious and often mortal wounds. The late great missiologist and theologian Robert Schreiter in his last published article said that a response to living within the Missio Dei today or the mission of God today <clears throat> is to engage in a mission ad vulnera, or a mission to the wounds of the world. At the beginning of his pontificate, Pope Francis offered a striking image of the church as a field hospital. And he said in that interview, I see clearly that the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness, proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. I don't like that military uh, language so much, so I would say after a natural disaster, as the picture to the, to the left uh, shows you. You have to heal the wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, heal the wounds. In 2019, some 90 scholars met in a conference held at our SVD house in Germany, uh, St. Augustine's Mission Seminary. Uh, and the title of that conference was Locating European Missions in a Wounded World of Deep Transformation. Just last year, the International Association for Mission Studies met in Sydney. You see pictures of, of uh, um, Anthony and Tian there, and then the, the logo for the, uh, for, the, for the YAMS meeting. And their title, our title, was Powers, Inequalities, and Vulnerabilities, Mission in a Wounded World. In 2022 as well, um, a friend of mine, Michael Beal, who's a German theologian, uh, works out of Hamburg, uh, and a number of others from various countries around the world, uh, reflected on the woundedness of situations worldwide in a really wonderful book that commemorated the 100th anniversary of the International Missionary Council which became, when it connected with the WCC, the commission I was involved in for the last eight years, the Commission on World Mission and Evangelism. So it's a really very, very special book. And also in 2022, our Society of the Divine Word joined this theme of wounded world to another that has lately emerged as an important missiological topic, and that is the topic or the theme of discipleship. So our general light announced that the theme for its 2024 general chapter would be, your light must shine before others, faithful and creative discipleship in a wounded world. Schreiter noted, in his um, talk at the German conference I mentioned before and in his published version, that, that Christian mission has always had some sense of this ministering um, uh, within and to a wounded world. But in the wake today of so much suffering experienced in our unstable and globalized world, 
tending to the world's woundedness has really taken on a particular urgency in mission practice and also in reflection on mission in missiology. So it's on this theme that I've been asked to reflect in this presentation. And I'm going to do this in three parts. First of all, I will just name briefly some of the wounds of the world today. And then second, I'll reflect on the nature and significance of discipleship in the light of Evangelii Gaudium and also several documents from the World Council of Churches. And then finally, in the third section, I'll reflect on how discipleship is both faithful and creative as Catholics and, of course, other Christians strive to become a truly synodal church, especially through the practice of prophetic dialogue. So let's look, first of all, at our wounded world. And this is very, very brief. There's no need to go into detail here. The litany is long and sadly all too familiar. But I wanna just highlight four aspects to speak about our wounded earth, our wounded sisters and brothers, our wounded political systems, and our wounded church. Just going to present some pictures, images, and a quote or so for each one of these. So first of all, our wounded earth. As Francis says in Laudato Si, our earth, our home, is becoming to look like an immense pile of filth. I think that's the most chilling line in that beautiful and wonderful encyclical. Yeah, our wounded sisters and brothers, again from uh, Pope Francis in Fratelli Tutti, what is thrown away are not only food and dispensable objects, but human beings themselves. Our wounded political systems. Pope Francis writes again in Fratelli Tutti, ancient conflicts thought long buried are breaking out anew, while instances of a myopic, extremist, resentful, and aggressive nationalism are on the rise. And finally, our wounded church. The Plenary Council of uh, Australia says in their second final decree, we express our profound sorrow that children and young people and vulnerable adults have been abused by clergy, religious, and lay workers of the Catholic Church, and that religious leaders have failed to act sufficiently to prevent or respond to abuse. And then also from the Plenary Council, the Catholic Church in Australia has been caught up in this history of dispossession, stolen generations, racism, and the undermining of language and culture. So this is very brief, and in, in uh, uh, the, the original text that I wrote for this talk, um, it, there's, there's much more detail, but really there's simply no doubt that mission in today's world needs to be a mission ad vulnera, to the wounds, as Robert Schreider has named it. And I would even say that mission has to be mission inter vulnera. That is that we missionaries need to be sharing in the pains of these wounds uh, and, and, and sharing in the life of the people that we serve. In the words of Pope Francis, mission today must be lived out in nearness, proximity, by warming the hearts of those who are suffering, and by working to heal the wounds and stop what is causing them. The mission today needs to be done by women, men, and young people who are faithful and creative disciples. Let's look, look now at this idea of discipleship. And I have proposed, and I'll explain this as I go on, <clears throat> the uh, title for this is Transforming 
missionary disciples. The notion of discipleship is, is deeply rooted in the scriptural witness, and therefore it's not a new term within the Christian tradition. But it has not been a term that has much prominence in ecclesiology or missiology to refer to the fundamental equality and dignity of God's people through baptism. The word disciple appears frequently in Vatican II, mostly to refer to Jesus's disciples today. And in the famous opening lines of the document on the Church of the Modern World, we read, the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the people of our time, especially those who are poor and afflicted, are the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the disciples of Christ as well. Most English translations use the term followers of Christ, but I checked the original Latin, and it's actually Christi discipulorum, the disciples of Christ. So it's a really a better translation, and it um, highlights this idea of, of discipleship. So discipleship has emerged in our own day as a term that expresses the essence of the Christian vocation and has been given a certain emphasis both in the teaching of Pope Francis and in the World Council of Churches. In both Francis and the World Council of Churches, it points to the fundamental equality and dignity shared by every Christian, first of all. But then it also signifies the dynamic missionary nature of Christian life. Discipleship is not just about me and Jesus, you know, my own personal spiritual life. It's about following Christ in mission. So there's this dynamic aspect. And it implies also an ongoing spiritual growth of life in Christ. And it demands a commitment to transforming the world as we disciples continue the mission of Christ today. So faithful discipleship is also a creative discipleship. Faithful discipleship calls for an openness to the constant presence and inspiration of the spirit that's constantly guiding the church in its mission. Discipleship is rooted in a communion of baptismal equality and dignity that calls forth participation in a synodal church that is constantly discerning mission, especially mission in a wounded world. I'm just going to uh, give two quotations uh, from uh, Pope Francis and uh, a kind of a paraphrase of, uh, uh, of something from the World Council of Churches. Um, one is from Evangelii Gaudium, the other is from a, a commentary on um, a, a document that was done by the World Council of Churches. Um, Pope Francis writes famous lines, the church goes forth as a community of missionary disciples. And Kenneth Ross, in his commentary on this document that came out of a mission conference uh, held by the WCC in, in Arusha, Tanzania in 2018, writes this. Somewhere in common memory is the knowledge that Jesus called people to follow him and that those who did were called disciples. The Arusha Conference brought this calling once again to center stage, proposing that this might be the driver of the transformation that our world so desperately needs. So both in the interest of ecumenism and mission, I would like to propose that we speak of transforming missionary disciples, that we speak of faithful and transforming missionary disciples. Missionary disciples comes from Pope Francis, transforming disciples comes from the World Council of Churches. And I think it's good to put them both together. Now, we can talk about four practices of transforming missionary disciples. Discipleship needs to be constantly deepened and cultivated through these four practices. 
First of all, the disciple constantly learns. Disciple has its roots in the Latin dishere, which means to learn. So disciples learn by paying attention, by engaging in contemplation, by lexio divina, by study, basically as sitting at, at, at basically as sitting at Jesus' feet. The disciple then is committed, secondly, to imitate. So disciples not only sit at Jesus' feet and learn, they walk in Jesus' sandals, so to speak. They take on his yoke, his vision, his compassion, his passion for justice, inclusive behavior, love for the poor, and practice of prayer. And they imitate Jesus as well by imitating him in the persons of other disciples and holy persons, both Christians and non-Christians as well. <clears throat> Disciples, thirdly, are committed to integrate. Jesus' sandals, when we first try them on, might be too large at first, but as we wear them day after day, our feet become accustomed to them. And what begins with imitation gradually becomes integration as we as disciples become other Christs in our world. St. Paul has written, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And finally, disciples innovate. They become creative. They take on the very mind of Christ, not only in his self-emptying, but in his following God's surprising and sometimes disturbing spirit. They follow the spirit of Jesus in their own time, in their own context, letting the spirit transform their imaginations like the spirit transformed the imaginations of the community in the Acts of the Apostles. And they moved from a relatively closed Jewish community to one that was open to all nations. So as disciples engage in mission, and especially mission in a wounded world, inter vulnera, among the wounds, new questions and possibilities emerge from technology, from science, from women and men on the margins from people of other faiths or no faiths. True disciples abound in creativity and critical discernment. Discipleship ultimately is really an art. So just as the, the true metal of workers in a field hospital is evidenced by their ability to innovate, to think out of the box, to be faithful to the science of medicine, and yet to do it in creative ways. So the true metal of transforming missionary disciples is evidenced in their ability to be faithful and creative as they tend to the wounds of the world. So let's look more closely at that faithful and creative transforming missionary discipleship, which is the topic of our reflection this evening. Faithful and creative transforming missionary discipleship is lived out in what has become the late motif of Francis's papacy, that of synodality. Synodality, people say, is a new mark of the church, a way of proceeding that is constitutive of the church. And Francis is convinced that synodality is what God expects of the church in the third millennium. My sense is that what missiologists have called prophetic dialogue is the method by which Francis's and God's dream of synodality for the church can be achieved. So let's look first at synodality, working toward a church of faithful and creative transforming missionary disciples. Synodality is rooted in discipleship. Discipleship is simply another way of speaking about membership in the people of God by virtue of baptism. And Francis says this is the image of the church that he likes, 
the image of the church I like is that of the holy, faithful people of God. It's a people in a journey through history. All the faithful, considered as a whole, are infallible in matters of belief through a supernatural sense of faith of all the people working together. So that idea of, of people, of pilgrim people, of a people anointed with the wisdom of the Spirit is what founds the idea of synodality. And so here is the essence of synodality, God's pilgrim people transforming missionary disciples, walking together, all with the nose, as Francis writes, to scent out, discover new ways to walk, lived out in conviction that the church is first of all a communion in which all are called to participation, moving towards decisions about mission in a wounded world. And as the preparatory document to the Synod says, by journeying together and reflecting together, the church will be able to learn through her experience which processes can help her live communion to achieve participation and open herself up to mission. The church, as we know, is a communion of churches. Uh, and every local church whether it's regional like that of Australia or diocesan as in the Archdiocese of Sydney or the Diocese of Townville or the Archdiocese of Accra or, or Manila or wh wherever it may be, every local church, regional or synodal, is a communion of local churches, parishes, ecclesial movements, religious communities, and so forth. And so synodality is expressed in each of these ecclesial expressions. In a parish, in a religious community, in an ecclesial movement, in a diocese, no one is excluded. All are welcome to open, to, to express their opinions and, and to share their wisdom. Women and men and youth, even prisoners, the homeless, the poor, disaffected, and where appropriate, even other Christians and members of other faiths or no faith. It's interesting that all of these are also SVD dialogue partners. So listening and sharing together, open to the scriptural witness and the witness of tradition, the synodal process is an authentic process really, of contextual theologizing, of contextual theology. Because there are never presupposed solutions or answers to how we engage in mission in a particular situation. And that's why doing, you know, uh, uh, being synodal is always a process of contextual theology. Every situation or issue has its own uniqueness. And so faithful discipleship is exercised in inclusion and listening to all. Creative discipleship will be exercised in communal discernment that will seek that, that will seek acting under the sometimes surprising guidance of the Holy Spirit. The synodal method, as the working document of the synod says, is, is called a conversation in the spirit. When parishes gather together, or parish councils gather together, uh, diocesan synods gather together, perhaps provincial chapters gather together, local chapters, <clears throat> there, is, there is this method of conversation in the spirit. It starts with personal preparation and prayer. And then each person, as she or he wants, is invited to speak. And then there's a time of silence and really listening. What have people said? And then each person shares what he or she has heard. And there's silence again. And then we move to decision, common discernment, and then thanksgiving for that. As I see it in this synodal process, faithful discipleship is in the first part, personal preparation, each person speaking, each person shares the fruit of listening. And then creative discipleship is in the actual movement, the actual decision 
to do mission in a particular situation. It comes out of the wisdom of the community who have reflected on the situation. Now, let's look at how synodality can be lived out through the method of prophetic dialogue. In the last two decades or so, the understanding of mission as engaging in prophetic dialogue has gained more and more prominence among theologians, missiologists, and mission practitioners as well. Its origin was in the SVD 2000 general chapter. It's been developed by many people, but uh, particularly um, by, by uh, Roger Schrader and me. And then it's been taken up by missiologists from the Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Evangelical, and Pentecostal traditions. So it strikes me that the practice of prophetic dialogue is very close, if not identical, to the vision and method of Pope Francis's vision of synodality. It might be the way that the synodal process might be carried out specifically by faithful and creative transforming disciples in the context of our wounded world today. In the exercise of prophetic dialogue, mission's first task is dialogue, is reverence for the situation in which we, the context in which we are doing mission, reverence for the people who are gathered to make the decisions, listening, presence, as one famous missiologist says, taking off your shoes in front of the context, in front of the people gathered together, because that ground is holy. So, as I say, this is in respect to the situation or context uh, uh, or a community of ministers, in respect to every member of the group that is gathered together as faithful and creative disciples. So as missiologists are proposing these days, mission needs to be understood not so much as mission agentes, just going to people, you know, kind of with, um, uh, with the pre-ready-made ideas, but rather intergentes, living among people, respecting their histories and cultures, appreciating their religions and customs, open to every disciple in the community, ready to be challenged and enriched by any of them. So today's missionary, as one author imaged it years ago, and I've always loved it, is more of a treasure hunter than rather a pearl merchant, seeking for the treasure in the context in which she or he works, rather than having, you know, something that she or he brings in that he or she feels is not there yet. So it's this basic dialogical attitude that is the foundation for the practice of prophetic dialogue. And this is the dialogue phrase of, uh, sorry, the dialogue phase of prophetic dialogue. This is, the, this is the phase of faithful discipleship, to listen to the context, to every member of the community. And it leads to the prophetic phase of the process in which faithful discipleship becomes creative to discover together what kind of prophetic action is needed in a particular situation. I think it's important to note the complexity of this word prophetic. We often think of its more confrontive meaning in line with the biblical prophets or uh, like Pat and Mick Dodson here in Australia, Martin Luther King, Oscar Romero, Dorothy Day, uh, Lena Gwobi in Liberia. But prophecy is a much broader reality. Not only did the biblical prophets confront injustice, they offered words and vision of hope, visions of hope in what seems like hopeless situations in Israel's exile. Prophets are those who tell the truth in the face of a narrative of lies. 
And they assure women and men of God's love and forgiveness, no matter what they have done. And they embody and demonstrate and proclaim the gospel in attractive and challenging ways. My friend and colleague, Vietnamese New Testament scholar, Van Tang Nguyen says, prophets criticize, but they also energize. So as a community gathers together in dialogue in the spirit of contemplation and openness to the situation and to one another, it works together to discern what is indeed the most prophetic action that is needed in this particular context. As the community prays together, reflects together, listens to one another, even argues with one another, when that happens, the Holy Spirit, and Francis in one of his uh, interviews assures us of this, the Holy Spirit, the God of surprises, the God of creativity, guides the community. Because each member is, is, uh, is anointed with that sense of the faith toward the most prophetic missionary action. Fidelity to the discipleship of each in the community yields the creativity of a missionary response. So the, the community might ask the question, what can the community do in the world's dire ecological crisis? How might the community ease people's suffering, people's wounds in this wounded world? How can it help to heal a wounded political system? How might it heal the wounds of a hurting church? There are no ready-made answers. There are no canned responses in mission. There are no automatic pastoral strategies. Every situation is unique that's shaped, by, that's shaped by history, culture, spirituality, and experience. In every situation of mission, a creative response is necessary. And only fidelity to the gospel, to the wisdom of the community, to the particulars of the situation can lead to a truly creative response. It's only faithful and creative disciples in a truly synodal church can offer a missionary response that can heal and transform a wounded world. So let me just say a few words of conclusion. In the midst of a wounded world, Pope Francis has offered a vision of missionary discipleship rooted in the rich theologies of the people of God, their baptismal equality, and Christians anointing with the sense of the faith. His call for a synodal church based on such a vision is radical and revolutionary. And so, of course, it has been mightily opposed. But it is a clear vision, very much in tune with God's vision of the future of our world. And it's a vision that can only be carried out through the guidance of the Holy Spirit and Jesus's continuing presence in the church and the world. It is a vision worthy of only faithful and creative disciples committed to minister in terra vulnera, warming the hearts of humanity with their nearness and proximity and healing the wounds. So thank you very much for your patience and listening. And uh, this is my presentation for this Murr lecture this evening. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that uh, insightful presentation. I think you've woven a lot of uh, very uh, familiar images of Pope Francis synodality, uh, mm -hmm. missionary creativity, discipleship, and others into a very coherent and creative presentation for us to really reflect on how all these different images uh, relate to one another, and especially in context of uh, prophetic dialogue, which is one of the concerns of the um, merit lectures that we've been presenting these past um, several installments, and yours is the fourth one. 
Um, mm -hmm. I invite uh, um, reactions, uh, comments, questions from uh, our participants. I see we already have a question from Man Li. Uh, he, has, he says the following, each person speaks and shares and create a community. This practice, excuse me, this practice idea, ideal works better in a small group, but it's so hard, even impossible in parish settings. Some said that the best moments when you, Father Stephen, gave a talk in Townsville was the time of dialogue, questioning, uh, and sharing. My question concerns is that our Australian province is expanding very much into expanding very much into parish settings. So how do we apply this ideal transforming faithful creative into parishes, especially the weak struggling ones? Thank you. Well, I mean, this itself is going to take a, a, a great commitment uh, and, uh, and a great creativity on the part of pastoral leaders. Uh, and I'm speaking from an outsider, uh, uh, from an outsider's perspective here. So I can't speak, you know, as a member of the Australian province or the member of any of, you know, the, uh, the Australian dioceses. But it seems to me that, um, you know, you, you probably could start uh, with, um, you, you know, a, a parish council. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, which is a smaller group. Uh, in uh, Townsville, they're, they're now called, I believe, mission councils, something like that. And, um, and so, you know, to start with a smaller group, and then perhaps also to have listening sessions in the, in the larger uh, parish situation, and then have the um, people in the parish council hear that, you know, I think that would be, be one way of doing it. I think, you know, if our, in the, in the, the expanding Australian province, uh, we have our local communities and our, in our local districts, you know, and those are the smaller kind of groups that can, can share, uh, you know, more, more frankly, more intimately and so forth. And then when you come to something like a provincial chapter, you know, all of these ideas uh, can be, um, you know, are, are, are brought having been, you know, worked out by, by smaller groups, by local communities. And then, you know, a provincial chapter can make a, make a decision. But I, I it, it does take, as I say, commitment. And I think it does take creativity uh, of of the the pastor the pastoral leaders in the particular situation, and uh, I think that as we you know learn more and more and get more and more committed to synodality, you know I think we'll feel more comfortable in that kind of process. One of the things I just uh, I don't want to go on too long here, but one of the things that might happen in the synod um, is that it's possible that canon law could be could be changed to say that right now pastoral councils of, of parish councils only have a what do they call it a consultative um, role the parish priest makes the decision canon law could be changed to make that a little stronger you know in a in a synodal church you know there may be the, you know Leadership, I think, still has to be there, but I think it could be a, 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 you know, it almost sounds like, well, the people can talk, but I'm going to make the decision. I think it has to be, you know, much, uh, much different uh, than, uh, than, than that. But, you know, these are, these are some of the ideas, Manly. It's good to see you. Thank you very much Stephen, <laughs> for that reaction. Uh, Ross has a comment. Ross, can I invite you to uh, voice your comment so that we have various voices uh, this evening instead of just uh, Stephen and myself? Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, Antin. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> hi, Ross. Hi. Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you for your, uh, for your work for the province and uh, for the church. I've just been thinking about um, the ones that we Christians have created in the past, as, let's say, 150, 200 years ago, uh, perhaps have not been acknowledged enough. Um, I'm, and I'm thinking... Uh, where the part of the uh, creative discipleship is to start with uh, 
in a spirit of penitence, <laughs> uh, you know, asking for forgiveness before we start to venture out and 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 heal the wounds of the world. Do you have any comment on that? Thank you. I I, I think that makes that makes a lot of sense, Ross. And and uh, uh, you know, I I I I think that kind of you know, maybe brings me down to earth a little bit more too. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. You know, it's like, it's one of these, aha, of course, you know, and it's interesting. I, I, um, I think, I don't know if I mentioned to you or, or some people during my, my retreats, there's actually a new book out now uh, on, on missiology by uh, someone in Canada, a missiologist in Canada. And the book is called Mission as Penance. <laughs> so I haven't read it yet, but it, it's a very intriguing title, and I think it works very much into your insights. So before we, you know, uh, say we have the answers, I think we also have to recognize, you know, the damage, the wounds that we have, we have inflicted on the world and on the church. So yeah, thank you very much for that. That's a that's a really a a good call to uh, to reality, and I, I think a, a really important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Uh, we have an interesting comment from Otto. Otto, can I invite you to also voice your comment as well? No? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Father Anthony, for yes. giving me the opportunity to oh, make I a comment. A... Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Father uh, Bevans, Father Stephen, yeah. for your uh, inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Otto Gusti. I'm uh, working at Leralero Institute of Philosophy and Creative uh, Technology, but I am in, at, uh, in uh, Doris Maru College now in Boxil. Uh, discipleship in a wounded world demands us to develop an, a kind of uh, an open-eyed uh, mysticism. Uh, I, I could uh, interpret it, interpret like that what you uh, presented, Father uh, mm -hmm. Bevans. Yes. It means uh, it is not enough uh, just to pray or to uh, celebrate Mass every day right. in order to uh, live our uh, spirituality or our Christianity. Yes. More than that, uh, we have to be involved right. in fighting for justice, right. showing our solidarity to the poor or... Uh, I think we have to be political in in order to be uh, mystical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm working uh, in a formation house in Ledel Row uh, in the university as well. Uh, I would like to hear your uh, suggestion. What should we do in a formation house uh, in order to uh, realize this? Uh, yeah, this kind of discipleship. Uh, in the life of our uh, formandi or uh, our formatures as well yeah thank you yeah i i i wish i had the answer to that Otto. <laughs> but uh, one of the things I, I think about this a lot because i live in a formation house myself and i think one of the one of the things that i'm becoming more and more convinced of is is that some i, I don't know how exactly to do it but I think our students need to have a really adequate ecclesiology. I mean, this sounds, you know, highfalutin and everything, but this is the most practical thing, you know, to really understand that ordination does not make them above the people of God. You know, it rather commits them to the service of the people of God, and they are equals as disciples, you know, and 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 it, that's a conversion that I think has to go on, and uh, you know, I I think it, it, in many cultures, in particular, but almost all cultures in particular, the way that we have we have talked about priesthood or even religious life in terms of our brothers, that somehow or another it's a step higher than you know the people, and yet it's not; it's a step into responsibility for people it's a step into service pope francis talks about you know how we you know we we, we talk about the hierarchical church is this pyramid 
you know, that you have the Pope at the top and everything. He says, you have to invert this because, because the, because the, he calls them the ministers are the smallest of all. They are the, they are the, the, the ones who serve all. Now we have to, some, I don't know how <laughs> to convert our students to that. But I think if we can do that, then I think, you know, we can teach them, you know, processes of dialogue and processes of listening and, and, um, and, and, and then, you know, um, this kind of, you know, away from a simple kind of a, you know, dispensing the sacraments as what mission is all about. It is certainly about that, you know, and certainly good liturgies is certainly part of, of mission. But I think, you know, to, 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 you know, mission has to address people's real needs. And people's real needs are also in the area of food shortages, you know, and and lack of uh, lack of power uh, in uh, in uh, in a particular community, um, you know, all these kinds of things, and we have to learn how to, you know, work with you know the people in our parishes or in our communities, whatever it is, to find out what are those needs and what are the strategies or the or the uh, approaches that we have to make. That's how I think we can be creative in mission, not just the same old, same old. We know what the people need, you know, and we give them that and then they're going to be saved. You know, it has to be much more than that. So thanks. for. But I wish I knew the I wish I knew the answer how to do that, <laughs> you know, how to turn that big ship around, uh, you know, that uh, that 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 somehow sees that religious life ordination is a step higher rather than a step into responsibility and service. Uh, thank, thank you. you. It's good you, to Anna. see you. <laughs> we, have a, we have a comment and a question from another person who is in a formation house. Uh -oh. uh, Yon. So maybe I invite Yon to uh, give your comment and also present your question to Steve tonight. Hi, Yon. Turn on your microphone. It's on, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Steve, again for uh, your uh, uh, presentation. I just would like to comment. You know, it's it's good. Like like through your presentation, it's kind of to uh, promote the uh, the culture of being faithful and creative disciples. Mm -hmm. Like this is within our SPD as well. And I'm thinking about like you know being. A wounded healer, you know, that's we call ourselves yeah. mm -hmm. wounded healer. Mm -hmm. But we ourselves also even wounded, you know. Like we talk about the church, and our church is wounded, you know. We have a lot of homework to kind of to fix ourselves and our, our wound to be to be tended. And like how we as as a wounded church, you know, bring that healing also to the wounded world. You know, sometimes maybe in the context of uh, like here in Australia, a lot of people are wounded because of, you know, what happened in the church and abuse and, sure. you know, a lot of people are, are kind of, they don't really trust us, you know, mm -hmm. you know, how to regain the trust. I mean, on the other hand, we can be still, of course, a healer for, for the wounded world, but still there's kind of. Uh, lacking of uh, like trust to the church nowadays, yeah. yeah, it's kind of a tricky reality. Yeah, I think I think first of all, it maybe go it goes back to Ross's point that we have to acknowledge the wrongs that we've done. You know, we have to acknowledge that that uh, not only are we wounded, but we have wounded people. You know, and and so that that kind of a kind of penitence that's there, I think I think that it's you know I don't think we can simply snap our fingers or say you know trust us you know again because I think it's 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 really a disaster it's really a a a, a, a very serious wound that has been created, but I think maybe we can start by trusting the people. You know, by 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 listening to them, uh, by asking them their own sense 
by um, by you know uh, not being uh, uh, arrogant, you know, in our own leadership of a of a parish or of a church or of a diocese or or something like that. And 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 I think maybe if we can um, um, if we can learn to trust our people. You know who are our equals as disciples. You know, then perhaps they will get the message, and then maybe, you know, after God knows how long, how many years, you know, there we will gain people's trust again. But we have lost it, you know, and we can't just say trust us louder. You know, trust us, trust us. We're 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 okay now. You know, we no, <laughs> it's not going to work. You know, they have to, you know, they have to, um, uh, they, they have to see this and they will see this over years, you know, and over, you know, and, and you know, with bishops and clergy and so forth. I think, you know, I, I don't want to um, single out anybody or anything, but I think, you know, somebody like Tim Norton is somebody who could, you know, gain people. He trusts people and his simplicity and his, you um, uh, you know, just his, he doesn't take himself seriously, you know, uh, and, and, and I think this, this, you know, if our bishops and our priests can become like that, I think this will, this will, uh, uh, th this will begin the process, but it's going to take a long time. Yeah. You know, maybe not even in your lifetime, you know, but, uh, <laughs> there you go. We have a comment from uh, David who spent nine years in South Africa and he has That's some concerns true. about our ability to listen. David, would you like to uh, say some more about uh, your comment here? Hello, Steve. Thank you for your talk. Hi, David. Um, I've been doing some work around um, collective trauma. Uh-huh. And starting from the... Um, assumption or maybe experience that all co cultures are wounded all cultures carry um um trauma of some level in mm -hmm. fact that culture um provides a number of tools either to help um deal with trauma or even contribute to denial of trauma um and silencing of trauma now, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of it in the context of um, those who came to colonise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a New Zealander here, living in Queensland. So, mm -hmm. you know, the British Empire and coming to places on this side of the world mm -hmm. brought with them a significant woundedness. And I'm wondering whether the... Um, um, the sense of this was an okay thing to do to come and colonize and dispossess indigenous peoples of their land and their lives um that this sense of normality came out of a historical journey that um was shaped by trauma um, yes. mm -hmm. just to give it another angle often when there's an individual perpetrator going to court for some either sexual abuse or domestic violence or something like that, the mm -hmm. court will do a, um, um, a psychiatric assessment and often there's been trauma in the perpetrator's history. Mm -hmm. Yes. So looking at the collective history of, of perpetrators mm -hmm. of colonisation. And w this limits the ability to listen. Like the British who came here first we're not able to listen to First Nations people, to Aboriginal people. Um, they did at some level try and listen to Māori people, but they found that Māori ways of doing things were so different, they really couldn't understand. Yeah. Um, what I'm wondering is whether you've got a comment around just how difficult it is to um, be in a space to actually listen. Yeah. because of the baggage we bring to any situation. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think that's that's really one of the 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 key things in 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 the synodal process 
And I think in the, you know, the, the, the I think parallel process or, or, you know, similar process of prophetic dialogue, that, that, uh, that, that, that listening, don't, don't presume that you know what another pe person is going through. Don't presume that you know um, the wisdom that that person is going to bring to the uh, to the group or, or or to the situation. Yeah, I, I just think that that's um, that that's you know an absolute first step that 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 has to be done. And I think when you you know I mean there's probably you know more than than simply the, the the trauma being involved because there's other you know wisdom and all that stuff but but i think that is 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 really key you know to, to for people to share their wounds you know and and to and to name their wounds uh and uh people to share their woundedness i think it's absolutely important so yeah i mean i i i i, I couldn't say anything else except that is absolutely essential. That's foundational to this uh, to this whole process, you know. And this is what I hope that everybody can learn at the at the upcoming synod, and then this becomes, you know, the 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 modus operandi, you know, of the church. Uh, you know, this this kind of you know not presuming, uh, but but um, but uh, be open and curious. To listen to people. Uh, thank, thank you, you David. Uh, let me let me read a comment from Clement. Uh, he uh -huh. says last week the ACBC released their social justice statement, which was written in conjunction with the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander yes. Catholic Council. The statement recognizes the wounds caused in the past and the church's role in it. I think it's a great piece to read as it makes known the wounds and how we need to listen, learn, and love. So that falls right into with uh, uh, David's question and Stephen's uh, comments. Um, and uh, we have a comment from Marius, as we walk together as wounded people of God, sometimes the people of God can heal us or ha have healed us. It is a pilgrim journey. And uh, we have, a comment or a question from Casimir. I now invite Casimir uh -huh. uh, to uh, voice your comment. Hi, Steve. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I, I raised this question in line with my um, field of engagement, media and communication. You know, um, being a faithful and creative disciple or missionary in a wounded world is even more difficult on social media which is regarded as one of the most wounded realities that contemporary society face. Perhaps you have encountered a new document from the Vatican's communication industry. In order to achieve a full presence, we must first determine who is my neighbor, which is inspired by the parable of the Good Samaritan. And of course, there are many other ways also explained there. Mm -hmm. However, I believe that faithful and innovative discipleship involves more than just simply identifying our neighbors, our companions. How else or in what novel ways can SVD or missionaries uh, be creative disciples in contemporary society, particularly our engagement in social media, do you think? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, it's a great question. And uh, I am not the most social media savvy person in the world, that's for, that's for sure. In fact, I try to stay away from most social media. Um, but, um, but I, I, yeah, I, I, I think, um, um, I, I, I the, 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 the part that I, I would, you know, kind of reflecting on is that it just can't be about our neighbors or, or, you know, the Good Samaritan, of course, points out that, you know, that that's, that's not a that's not a great word because everybody is our neighbor, <laughs> you know, and so and so we have to listen to and and engage in people who are you know perhaps you know very much opposed to our own understanding and learn from them, you know, people of 
no faith or 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 people who are anti you know um anti church or or those kinds of things and of course you know all we got to do is we can find them easily on the <laughs> on the media you know and the social media but i i wish i wish Casper, i could i could answer you better but i'm probably um uh, too much of a what do they call it a you know a, a digital migrant uh, than I am a digital native, and I really can't, you know, I, I really can't um, uh, offer much wisdom in that regard. If I tried, I would just be, you know, beating the wind, I think. <laughs> so, but thank you for your question. I think it's a good question. And if anybody else has an answer to that, please, um, you know, please speak up because it, it's a, a very important question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Casper. Uh, we have a question from Taiwan, Father Artel. Uh, Father Artel, are you there? Would you like to uh, voice your comment and question? Okay, we. I don't see him. So maybe I'll just uh, read the question to you, Stephen. He says, um, a wounded world is not only being hurt, but for me, it is also a place or people or situation which has not, which not has been serviced. Father Bevins, what is your suggestion to face this situation? Could you could you read that again? Could, could okay, you read that again? Says, um, a wounded world is not only being hurt, but for me, it is also a place or people or situation which is not being served, serviced or served. Mm -hmm. Father Bevins, what is your suggestion to face this situation? I would say, you know, using the synodal process, using the process of prophetic dialogue to find out where those places are, you know, where, where, where people are not being served, you know, uh, and we can only do that, I think, by, um, you know, the, the people in our community or asking people, you know, in, in you know, um, uh, uh, other people in, in, our, in our community, you know, what can we do? Where can we, where can we help? What are the needs? So, you know, again, it's, it's I think, before we would say as a, a church, we know what people need you know and and um that's you know i think that's wrong i think we have to, to uh, discover this discover this together um and uh and discover it by asking people who are not just you know in our circle you know who also have blinders as well you know so um, the World Council of Churches uh, has this idea about mission from the margins and uh, talks about how we have to listen to 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 people whose you know whose voices we don't listen to. You know, it's it's wrong to say we have to give them voice. No, they already have a voice, but we have to uh, uh, but we have to listen to those voices and we have to ask them and we have to invite them. Uh, and I think that's how we can know these other places in the world that, um, you know, that are, are wounded because nobody cares about them. I mean, um, it, it, it's becoming better and better, but in the area of like disabled persons, you know, uh, in the area of it's uh, controversial, but LGBTQ persons, you know, we never, you know, we, we never really paid attention to this. And now we're beginning to, or in some, in some ways, you know, it's, it's an old thing already, but still needs more women. You know, we, we, we have to ask, we have to, we have to, we have to discover, we have to uh, open our eyes and our ears uh, to do, to do that. So, and I think that's, that's what I think the synodal process can do as well. And the prophetic dialogue process can do as well as as well too. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, we have uh, somebody who's logging in from a much earlier time zone in Rome, Kidovu. Uh, so, Kidovu, uh, if you're there, 
I would like to invite you to uh, voice your comment and question, which is uh, rather long in the chat. So uh, are you uh, there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Could you hear, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Good evening uh, to you. And here is uh, here is now uh, uh, the noon time here in Rome. So my greetings to you. Thank you very much, Father Stephen, for the very thoughtful reflection. Welcome. I appreciate uh, very much your idea of inter vulnera because it reminds me of the scenario where our Lord, the resurrected Lord, invites Thomas to touch his wounds. Mm -hmm. Having aware of the unique characters of Jesus' wounds, which is salvific and redemptive, I would like to learn more from your from you about the significance of the capacity and courage of Christ's disciples. In this case, we in showing our human woundedness in our synodal church in particular, mm -hmm. could you think that showing our human woundedness and fragility? is one of many possible ways of being transforming faithful and creative visionary disciples. Moreover, from the perspective of inter vulnera, do you have any suggestion for the way of reading the scripture? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think uh, you really hit on something important, Peter, and that is, and, and this, I think, um, you know, Ross was talking about that, and I uh, can't remember who else was 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 you know around this area. The whole question of vulnerability, you know, is is uh, you know admitting that we don't know everything, admitting that we are uh, that we are you know that we have been wrong. Um, you know, I I think this is uh, this will gain the trust. Uh, eventually of, uh, of, 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 of people. And, and so, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, one of the problems with, with, I think, uh, the church in, um, you know, in, in our, in our day is that, you know, well, we, you know, we have all the answers, you know, we simply have all the answers and, uh, uh, and, and we don't, you know, we don't, I mean, it, it, Contemporary science and contemporary psychology and biology and all these things, you know, we don't sometimes have a clue about these, and yet we pontificate, you know, about this, you know, about uh, you know um, d different problems that 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 come up in the world. So I think we have to have that that sense of vulnerability um, that um, that we don't know everything. And that we're willing to learn. We're willing to learn from experts. We're willing to learn from the wisdom of the spirit that is scattered throughout the church, you know, and sometimes in the, the most unlikely people. So, um, you know, I, I think, I'm not sure, Peter, if that completely answers your question, but for me, you know, showing our vulnerability um, rather than, you know, necessarily showing our wounds. Oh, look, look what, you know, people did to me. You know, I'm, I'm this poor oh, bitch yeah. that, you know, people are suing me and I'm so, uh, you know, that, I don't think that's, you know, that's not the, 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 the kind of thing that we need to do. But I think, you know, our own, our own vulnerability, our own, you know, as, as Ross said so well, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, our, our, our own repentance, a recognition of you know how how we've gone wrong in the past. I think these are all the important things. So I don't know, Peter, if this if this answers exactly uh, your uh, your questions, but um, or, uh, but but I you know that's that's about as best I can do. I think at this stage. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Stephen. Uh, I would like to call on Clement. He has a comment. And or question. Okay. Uh, it's a question. Uh, yeah, Steve, just uh, with the last question you answered, you spoke about uh, the openness to the spirit, 
like modern science and all that. Uh -huh. but, but we're also in a church that has its own yeah. traditions, that has its own languages sometimes defined. So how do we just oppose being faithful to these traditions, to scripture, to our SVD background, and also being open to doing things maybe different from how it's been in the past. How do we, yeah, it's, that's yeah. my question, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, what you're getting at, what you're getting at, Clement, is really the whole nature of tradition. You know, and sometimes I think we think of tradition as, well, um, you know, if if this is what, let's say, a pope taught, or this is what, you know, a, a, a particular verse of scripture says, then that's unchangeable, you know. Uh, but actually, if you look at tradition, these these statements are always within contexts. And sometimes those contexts are not according to, um, you know, correct science or, 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 you know, or, 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 you know, particular thinking. I mean, you know, you can find all sorts of stuff in the Bible, you know, degrading women, you know, but I think today, you know, um, we have a different anthropology, you know, and we have a different psychology. And so we have to say, those things are just wrong. You know, and that we have to open up things. You know, women are not second class creatures. They are absolutely equal to men. You know, and okay, we have, you know, different biological functions and sometimes different psychological functions and wiring and so forth. But the basic thing is there. You know, we can't say, well, you know, I mean, you know, something, well, you know, Jesus didn't ordain women, so we can't ordain women. I mean, you know, Jesus couldn't have ordained women because he wouldn't have thought that, you know, in his, you know, and I'm not necessarily advocating women's ordination, but you see, this, this is an example of something that we say, oh, this is absolutely cut and dry because, you know, this has been the tradition of the church, but the tradition of the church was working on a false anthropology, you know, and so we have to, in order to be faithful to the gospel sometimes we have to change our understandings you know the church said that galileo was wrong when he said the world was round or, or, or no i mean that the that the uh uh that the uh earth uh, the sun moves around the earth you know and 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 yet that's not true and so the vatican had to come out and basically apologize for that you know and that's not a tradition. It, it's just, it was just the way people saw the world, the cosmology of the world at that time. So we have to be open, I think, to, to see. Now we have to pr proceed carefully and, 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 and so forth. But tradition is not, you know, um, tradition is not something that never changes. Tradition is actually something that does change. I mean, to be faithful to tradition, we actually have to change, you know, according to, you know, the, the new ways of thinking, you know, new, uh, new worldviews and, 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 and so forth. So, you know, yeah. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Okay. A lot, a lot, lot in there. That's one of my favorite areas is, is the area of tradition, you know, so. We have a follow-up uh, comment from uh, Father Ross. Father Ross, I invite you to uh, give your comment. Oh, it's just um, um, just referring to shared vulnerability, uh, Stephen. Um, that. Um, is drawing us together. I think that's what I'm trying to say. I'm just thinking on a lot, not just us Christians, but people of goodwill, yes. people of other faiths. Right. Yeah, there is something powerful, I think, about sharing who we are yes. as, as brothers and sisters. Yes. Um, yeah. It, yeah. Um, so just oh, making no. me think, that's all. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was, you know, um, I, we're in the second day of retreat here in Alice Springs. And I gave the talk, you heard it a couple of weeks ago on, you know, the the um, uh, culture of encounter. And I think it's it's that kind of thing that we have, you know, all real living is meeting, you know, <laughs> the, you know this idea, we just, we just have to be ourselves with one another, you know, and, and uh, then the wisdom can, can, can come out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Stephen, I'm uh, going to give you sort of, uh, I think, the last question for, the, for okay. this evening, and it's for myself. Okay. So uh, in the preparation uh, to the general chapter that's happening uh, later uh, next year, uh -huh. uh, part of the process has been to reflecting on our own wounds as SVDs. Uh -huh. and, and you're also in Australia province to be giving retreats to our conferences, and I'm sure Part of the process is going to be reflecting not only on the wounds of the world and of the church, and I'm not asking you to air our laundry or anything, yeah. but in the process of us reflecting on our wounds as SPDs in community and as members of the, the, the society, how do you think this will also help us in the process of becoming transforming missionary disciples? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I think I think that's that's very true. That's very true, Anthony. I, I mean, um, you know that 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 we all you know living in community and and uh, and uh, you know um, with our vow of obedience and 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 so forth have been oftentimes uh, you know, wounded, you know, by one another, you know, by our leadership, whatever whatever it might be. And I think it's good, you know, I mean, um, I think it's good to get that out there as well. But I think that's part of, you know, real community, uh, community building. And, and uh, you know, and, and it's, it's dangerous because some people can just pose as victims and, you know, and then actually the, the, the bigger story is, is quite something else, you know. But I do think that this is, uh, this is necessary, you know, so um uh, you know in the process of tending to the wounds of the world we have to tend to our own wounds you know our own our own vulnerabilities and our own hurts absolutely yeah but i i would i would hope that the general chapter wouldn't simply focus on that i think i i think it is it, focus on you know um it, 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 you know that 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 uh, we we have to be more aware of the wounds of the world and more and 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 more um, uh, you know as we do our discipleship to to become to become better members of the SVD community. I think this is one of the big things you know that. Uh, that uh, that sometimes keeps us apart as I you know go around the world and talk to people and things like that and I know from my own province and being on my provincial council and you know that this is um you know it's 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 a it's a, a big problem but I don't think we should let the you know our own woundedness get in the way of the the bigger realities you know uh, that uh, that that we have you know, taken vows for, that we've been ordained for, you know, that we have committed ourselves to, to the society for. Um, Thank you very much. I think we have uh, finished the various questions and comments. So I would like to uh, invite Clement to give any announcements or and also before uh, Clement comes up, I would like to thank you again, Stephen, for being with us tonight, I know you're tired from your trip, from various talks today and also time difference, but you're always sharp and insightful and profound as usual. And so uh, on behalf of everybody here, we appreciate very much. And uh, we look forward to the next time we can hear from you again in this or other venues. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming tonight. Uh, and thank you, Steve, for your talk, as Anton has already mentioned. Uh, what we're going to do is that for the next talk, we will keep 
announcing as we did this morning. And mostly it's on our SVD Facebook page, the province Facebook page. So kindly follow and also as you get it, share it to other people that they could all get involved. But we will keep you posted and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Good night. Thanks, Karen.